Is training like a professional a good target for most cyclists? Um, I would say in the majority of cases, at least initially, no. I think it's something that people, a mistake that people quite often make whenever they either are just starting or whenever they decide to kind of step it up from the level that they're currently at is that they they look too hard at like the top end specifics of what the pros are doing because there's so much information now about what everyone's doing and kind of uh and i think generally cyclists are just so keen to latch onto those things and try to apply them to their own training but i just see so many examples of people who are focusing on those if you think little things like the cherry on the top of the cake when they're not actually really they haven't got the base sorted yet you know yeah. they're they're focusing too much on those niche little things and neglecting gaping holes and uh, just the very very obvious things that need to be need to be dealt with so i am 100% one of those people i'm the worst kind of athlete back in my day so i was working full time and i specifically like to the words I used to tell people I want to train like a pro and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So like I didn't have a childhood. I used to play sports and was active as a didn't kid. Have a childhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I guess I did have a childhood. Is 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 probably a better way of putting it. I wasn't a, a standout athlete as yeah. as a child like yeah. some people are, which is what then grooms them into. You know, I imagine Jobber was probably a really good athlete when he was in school. I wasn't one of those people, so I yeah. wasn't like naturally groomed into sport. So when I came at it. Uh, in my mid twenties, it was like right. So I'm going to see what I'm capable of. I'm going to see how fast I can be at this, mm -hmm. this w whatever. At the time, and that's commendable, obviously. You know. uh, I just, I well, I think I just approached it. What I did was exactly what this is saying. I was like, right. So how do the pros do it? Let me try and do that whilst also having a job and a life. Yeah. So I got a coach who was actually amazing and. Without him, God knows what have happened because he was constantly telling me to back off with stuff. Uh, and telling me off where it was like, that was meant to be an easy session. Why were you at threshold? I'm like, oh, it was fun. Um, so I was I was training upwards of 20 hours a week as well as having a full-time job. So I was training in the morning, in the evening, on the weekends, just all of the time. And it was just not very healthy. Do you find people still doing these kind of things oh, in this yeah. day I mean, and age? All the time, all the time. It's, it's just, it's a commendable thing to set, you know, high target for yourself and be be keen and you know all those things are good but it's just a case of I think only starting from where you're at and not trying to jump forward you know three steps just just focusing on what you're doing making improvements to that and then you know changing the ethos I think that um a lot of the time whenever I take people on they're quite often surprised at how the training is easier than what they would have expected or are a big proportion of the training is at a lower intensity from what they expect yeah i think that um people have this idea that you need to smash every session and if you don't finish every single session you know knackered then you haven't done it properly and um i think there's also a even when you are basing your training on what the pros are doing like the pros tell you about that really hard session that they did with loads of savage intervals and or you know they're going and re reconning mountain stages or like cobble sections or whatever, like they tell you the fancy stuff, but they, they don't tell you about what they do 80% of the time, which is actually not all that different from what you're doing. So it's all about getting the right proportions of the right intensities. Mm -hmm. And quite often people are surprised by how little of the hard stuff that involves. Yeah, It's easy to fall into the trap of trying to recreate their watts rather than trying to recreate their intensity, actual, I guess, isn't it? what their body's really doing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and just and neglecting the basics like sleep above anything, get your cycle right. If you're combining it with a job and a family, it's all about those things that are just rigid. You can't move those things. You might be able to, you know, slightly change your working hours or whatever. But at the same time, you need to earn money and you're not a pro yet. You need, if you have a family and those commitments, they aren't just going to disappear. And it's it's all about keeping all of those plates spinning, but at the same time trying to train with the most effectiveness. And, you know, I think a, a lot of the time 
when I start with somebody, I quite often just tell them, I'm going to try to help you make the best use of the time that you have. It's just, tell me how much time you can commit to this. I'm not going to tell you how much time to commit to it. You tell me how much time you've got. And we're just going to try and reasonably and sensibly make the best use of that. And to me, that's the most sensible thing you can do. What's your opinions on like the effects of cycling marketing and how that trickles down into uh, normal people's lives, like uh, the marketing around nutrition and bike weight and aerodynamics and all of that stuff? I, I kind of feel I spend a lot of time telling people that these things are not worth it or that, you know, um, to not look at these nice things. And I don't want people thinking that I don't believe in the benefits of those things. I think I'm not saying those things have no benefit at all. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about nu nutritional products. Yes, absolutely. They will be better, but it's just a case of how much difference do they make? You know, it, you know, if, if I was, when I was doing a professional bike race, I wanted to make sure I was on the best bike. I was eating the best stuff. I was as well prepared as I possibly could be because Mentally, as much from, a, from my mind, I needed to believe that I'd had the be best preparation possible. Mm -hmm. There was just like a comfort in knowing that, okay, everything's, everything's in place here for me to perform. At an elite level, absolutely. But I think we are talking to those people who are not at that point. They, they might be doing, they might just be out with their cycling club or they're doing a gravel event or whatever. And it's, it's are these, and, and these people are the ones that have got the money. And it's quite often those people that are just having all these fancy things, but like leaving massive gaps as well. Yeah, I, I guess doing. The, I guess one of the anomalies is just rich people that can just buy a fifteen grand bike and go and race yeah. crits on, and if they crash it, they don't. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I was going to get a coach, I would without a doubt work with you and James because I am at the point where I know having a 10,000 pound bike or a 2000 pound bike isn't really going to make a difference to me because the only thing that actually holds me back now is riding, mm -hmm. uh, actually doing it and what sessions to do and making it fit with my life and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, but then, you know, if, if someone can afford the best nutrition in the world and the best bike in the world and the best wetsuit in the world, if they're a triathlete and the best trainers, you know, sure, fine, whatever, but don't think that that is going to replace the training th that you should like be doing. A, there's this thing about cyclists as well, which like I never had, you know, which was just this, the the look thing that all oh, like, I I, <laughs> I remember uh, doing my first race in the south of England. So we're talking 2008. And I'd been racing for, you know, I'd, I'd already been at university in Newcastle, racing in the north. I remember going down and doing, it was called the Surrey Five Day, which was this amazing event down, you know, this, well, it wasn't just in Surrey, but in the south of England. And um, I remember showing up with a group of riders from Ireland and we all just had like, my shirt, my jersey didn't match my shorts, my bike, you know, that Cannondale I was telling you about, but, you know, nothing fancy, did not look the part at all. Yep. Should have all these fancy teams, matching kit, nice socks, new white shoes, all that, you know, carbon wheels, never carbon wheels were very rare. I remember thinking, right, okay, this is going to be, these guys look, these guys look good. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to be on for a hard day here. And I won the bike race. Congratulations. In, you know, <laughs> not matching, my shorts didn't match my jersey. You know, it was just yeah. because all those things that, all this look, all the, it was just this uh, environment of kind of how you look being more important than what what's actually underneath, underneath the bonnet. That leads us really nicely into talking about the pro look um which i think a lot of people get into their head and it is more than you know it's having the right bike it's being the right weight it's having a bike that weighs under a certain amount of kilos um and kind of trying to emulate the pro cyclist look like for example do you shave your legs still no i and i used to shave my legs before my first bike race. I never shaved my legs through the winter, even when I was racing full time. Yeah. And I would shave my legs if I was doing a bike race, but I quite like having, I like 
I feel masculine. I've, I've, I, I feel like a grown man when I've got hairy legs, <laughs> you know? And even when I ride a bike, I don't care. People sometimes will point it out and I don't care. So that, cause it's, it's almost like, uh, well, it's, it's, you wouldn't be taken seriously in a lower level crit race if you didn't have your leg shaven. Yeah. It'd be like, oh, he's not shaved his yeah, legs. I mean, probably going to be a sketch fest. There's actually more, more evidence nowadays that it does actually provide an aerodynamic, aerodynamic <laughs> advantage. So it, you it know, breaks up the air. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a reason we do it. And um, like I was saying about the equipment, like if I if I was taking that race seriously, I'd be shaving my legs. Yeah. Because... I wouldn't, I'd, I wouldn't want any extra drag that wasn't necessary. It, the case is just like, if you go out, out on a Sunday with your mates, it's, do you need to do it at that point? You know? Obviously stuff like shaved legs and what socks you have and all of that is kind of, it's trivial. You can do it or not do it. But I guess when it comes to diet and body weight and those kind of things, do you think that that pro image um, that people try to emulate can that have damaging effects on, on people? Definitely the body image part. So, you know, I think when a lot of people, young cyclists or even, you know, club cyclists, whatever, they have a certain body image that they're striving for, which to them is the, the body image that belongs to a, prof- a successful professional cyclist. And, um, and also, you know, I don't look good. In as, I, I wouldn't say that I look as good in Lycra as I used to because my physique is not, what it used to be and it just doesn't look as good you know and if but i'm okay with that you know i think mo- both of both of us would be fine with that but i think the the danger is that people strive for this particular body image and they have an idea of what a professional cyclist looks like and quite often they will base that on the guys that win the tour de france so you know in order to win the tour de france you need to be able to climb up mountains you know multiple mountains on over multiple days better than the people around you. And that requires being very, very lean. If you think about, you know, Vingegaard, Parker Chart, these are very, very skinny guys. But um, so I, I was working with a cycling team this year and we had a, a meetup at the beginning of the year and I showed them a picture of the podium from the world in Yorkshire in 2019. And that was the, obviously we had the worlds in the UK this year as well. But at that point it was, the biggest bike race that had been in the UK for the last 20 years at that point. And the three guys that ended up on the podium were Mads Pedersen, who's a big guy, uh, Stefan Kung, another big guy, and Matteo Trentin. They are all grown men. They're mu- they're, they have muscular body types. Like They are not skinny cyclists when you picture a skinny cyclist. And they had just finished top three in the world over British roads Mm -hmm. and I think whenever people have an idea in terms of aesthetics but then I think also in terms of performance what makes a a cyclist physique I think sometimes our perceptions are wrong um you know those guys aren't going to win the Tour de France but then neither is anybody who's listening to this you know but you might want to prove yourself through the UK racing scene and then move on to racing up mountains. But you're not going to get the opportunity to race up mountains if you've not performed well in this scene. In order to do that, you you need to be strong. You need to be fit. You need to be able to actually ride a bike properly as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think the, the, the perceptions are very, very different. You know, you think about Wiggins, whenever he won the Tour de France, he slimmed down. There were four years. When people picture Bradley Wiggins, they think of him when he was as lean as he was when he won the Tour de France. But that was only a period of about four years where he was targeting Grand Tours. Whenever he was targeting, you know, pursuits or he put on weight in order to win the the World TT Championships in 2014 and then to compete for the pursuit team in in the Olympics in 2016. You know, so he, he was adapting his physique in order to fit what he was targeting. And for lots of people, you know, they think it's all about being thin. It's it's not. It's about being strong and lean is part of it, but you know, it's about it's about the engine really. Even throughout my career, my body type changed, and then my my strengths and weaknesses changed as well. So you know, it it it's. But 
the leanest I got. I remember I had that thing we're talking about where that I wanted to be really, really skinny. And I, I remember having a, it was one of the leanest I already was. And I remember having a winter vomiting bug and I was literally the, the, the lightest my adult self had ever been. And I was unwell. I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, wow, I, I liked what I saw. Yeah. It's crazy, you know? I, I had a sort of similar experience. So the, the lightest I ever was, was just before a race that I was making a big deal for. And I was so proud of myself that I was like uh, just just unbelievably skinny. And there was a couple of pictures of me from before the race, just in a pair of running shorts. And I saw them like a week later mm-hmm. and I was so upset at how ill I looked. Yeah. That I was like, I have to change I mean, this. I've, I've compared, you know, well, both young men and young women looking at cycling magazines to generally young women looking at, you know, girls magazines and the kind of that striving for that particular physique mm. and and the damage we know about the damage that it does for, you know, lots of girls. And then it, 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 it can be similar in cycling and even, you know, exercise can be a form of bulimia and, uh, it's, it's, it can, it can get to the point where it's very unhealthy. So we, we talked before the show about how people get their motivation and how sometimes it can be actually from quite a negative place. Do you, uh, as part of your coaching, deal with, uh, or how do you deal with the the, ne- the negative effect or the negative mentality of going into into training? Yeah, I think I think what we were talking about was where people's motivation comes from and whether it's kind of either like achieving in order to compensate for some sort of lack that they have or else trying to prove people wrong or you know doing something or or almost like fear of failure you know they're they're training because they're afraid that if they don't they won't achieve Mm -hmm. and that's you know you can't win if if that's your mindset there's no winning because it you either get it and then it's just relief or you don't get it and then it's you know self-criticism or whatever and I think um for me from my own experience and then also with the the people I work with as well it's it's really just about trying to see what what they're really motivated by what inspires them and also kind of why they're doing it and and it, it's it it should be something that you just are interested in something there just should be some fun in it if you look at the best pros the real top ones they're having a great time mm-hmm. you know they're they're enjoying themselves and the whereas a lot of other people who are who are trying to strive for that it just looks like a chore you know and the, yeah. they, they don't they're not actually getting anything from it you know there's an element of playfulness you, you look at like Pogacar he's, he's got this playful character Sagan was the classic example where he yeah, yeah. it was all just a big show and fun and I I, I felt vict- fell victim sometimes of just not having the fun anymore yeah you know and but I think you get the best out of yourself if you're if you're in, enjoying yourself if you still have that passion you're still connected to that reason that you started so you're effectively doing it because you want to do it, not because you feel you have to do it. Yeah. And and, and I think as well, it, but it's a difficult mindset to switch. You know, it, it's, it's not like, oh, you should just want to do this because you want to do it, not because you feel like you're afraid of, you know, not being able. It, it's a very, very difficult thing to, to really break, you know? Um, but I think a lot of it's just about having conversations with people. I think as well, managing expectations because, if people are always setting their sights on something, which is maybe just un- unrealistic, then that never ends well as well. That, that is a hundred percent of all of my training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Until very recently. It's just like, for example, if you try and just recre- recreate some what's that are unrealistic, then mm. you're just going to break down and, and it will, it will, the training will actually break you rather than, build you up and I think at all points you know it you should feel like you want to do it not every single day but you, there should still be an element of you that enjoys the work and also you don't need to be knackered all the time 
you know <laughs> the, the, you, should, you should have energy for other things in your life and uh and that that energy will just transfer and it is it, 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 keeping yourself mentally in the right place and you know it, not getting consumed by it i know so many people where it's like it becomes the biggest thing and they're not they're not even doing it anywhere near full time they're just got jobs and families and everything and they just get so obsessive about it and it's you know it can be quite damaging and i think also counterproductive i th I, th I think i think you've hit the nail on the head there if and i think a really good benchmark for this stuff because there is there is nothing wrong with being really into something but i guess the thing to always be aware of is do you actually enjoy it because if you're not enjoying it there's just no point yeah i mean and that's also it is a a marker of overtraining as well if you're if you're not got any interest in it if there's no kind of part of you that's interested in it and and if 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 you really are choosing to do something you should be choosing it because you want it and if that if that sort of passion starts to disappear then that's usually a, a sign that something's wrong 